Okay, so uh, welcome everyone, and uh, good turnout, so thanks very much for coming. I'm Nels Pearson, Director of the Humanities Institute and Director of the School of Humanities, and I'd like to welcome you to, to tonight's alumni panel on the humanities and careers. And before we get going, I just wanted to thank Richard Greenwald, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, for helping to fund this event, and uh, my so the Associate Directors of the Humanities Institute, uh, Dr. Patricia Berry in history, who's over here, Dr. Geraldine Johnson in modern languages and literatures, who is here, and thank them for uh, their uh, excellent support throughout the year and throughout the several years of their role with the Institute. And also, of course, thanks to our invaluable program coordinator, Ms. Elizabeth Hastings, who's not here tonight, but who has helped us to set this up as she helps with so many things. And we're honored tonight to have with us four alumni who majored and minored in humanities disciplines at Fairfield and who will be sharing their career stories with us. And in order of graduation years, these are Jason Mancini, uh, Dr. Mancini, who is a history major from 1994 and is now executive director of Connecticut Humanities, of the Connecticut Humanities Council. Uh, then we have Courtney Darts, who graduated in 2001 with a double major in art history and English, and she's now legal director of Pro Bono Partnership in New York City. And then we're also fortunate to have with us Matt Pecoraro, third on the panel, who graduated with a uh, major in philosophy and minor in classical studies in 2011, and he is the uh, public policy associate at Harvard Medical School's Judge Baker Children's Center. And then Carolyn Marino, who graduated with an English major as well as Spanish and Religious Studies minors in 2011, and she is program coordinator of the prestigious Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. And so we have quite a distinguished panel. Uh, you know, last year's panel, we had people who were in industry and in business, and this time we showcase a different variety of careers that people with humanities majors are able to get. And before we, wanted to, uh, before we go into this, I just wanted to say a few words myself Two years ago, the Humanities Institute created the, an initiative called Humanities at Work. And that initiative the, is a series of events and resources that showcase the important role that humanities majors and minors play in professional life and society at large. And I would just encourage you, if you get a chance, to check out the website. In fact, if you are in the seats and if you just Google the phrase Humanities at Work, it'll send you right to that. We are the leading institution with that project title. And up here, we have a statement from me about humanities and careers. We have videos from previous panels of majors and minors in the humanities talking about the careers that they've earned. You'll see the wide variety of, uh, of careers that they're working on. We also have tons of resources. If you want to read up on any of the information, I'll briefly drop on you about the humanities and careers. It's all here. Lots of information in the media that uh, will talk to you about how people are translating liberal arts into careers. But the quick and the skinny of that material online is that you know, while we don't spend a lot of time in the humanities courses and in liberal arts courses talking about jobs, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that they don't, they don't lead to them. But it's important to first recognize why is it that we don't do that? I mean, why are we not really talking about specific career skills in classes? Well, I mean, you know, we're drawn to philosophy, languages, history, literature, and the arts because they challenge us to comprehend the historical, ideological, and spiritual depth of human experience, to think and write creatively, theoretically, and critically about the ideas that shape our world. Right, as Tyrus Miller, who's the Dean of Humanities at UC Irvine, says one of the values of engaging in philosophical and critical thought is thinking deeply through the fam frameworks that confine our decisions and knowledge itself, which he actually says is one of the reasons the humanities will uh, shape the world in the future. But the story we often forget to tell, therefore, you know, because we're so focused on those pursuing those ideas for their own sake in class and thinking through the implications of the, the ideas that have shaped human history, uh, it doesn't mean that at the end of that we haven't gained a tremendous amount of skills that translate into the workforce, and often we just don't tell the story of that, right? So the story we often forget to tell is that en route to those goals, we acquire skills of analysis, global cultural awareness, critical inquiry, and ingenuity, as well as, the inability, as well as the ability to articulate ideas to different audiences that give us distinct advantages in a variety of professions while also making us crucial contributors to uh, social, civic, and de democratic life. 
So in recent years, universities have increasingly focused on vocational education or using majors to train for specific jobs, which has meant that this diverse and adaptable skill set of humanities and liberal arts majors often gets overlooked. Recently, though, this trend is changing. And if you've paid attention to the news lately or you know, the me national media, really starting to see that tide change, the idea of, the, the, of busting the myth that the humanities don't lead to uh, in careers and professions. It's, it's really been kind of a groundswell of, of a turning tide. And many of the people who are making these comments about the value of humanities and careers are not themselves in the humanities. It's all the people who are in economics, people who are in business, people who are in the sciences, and they're really chiming in to say, you know, we took the wrong turn here nationally when we started seeing the uh, education as only leading to a job, as well as forgetting the liberal arts sort of career skills that get built in, in the process of doing that. And so, uh, for example, Steve Perlstein here, the economics columnist from the Washington Post, uh, who points out that choosing a major based on intellectual curiosity doesn't detract from, but in fact prepares you for today's dynamic career arcs, not to mention their more traditional role in preparing us for an active and thoughtful uh, role in a democratic society, as well as the ability to be leaders in that society. Uh, after all, this is the definition, the classical definition of liberal arts, ars liberalis, is the, you know, not that they are liberal, but that they're, they're, li they're liberating, right? They offer us the ability to gain freedom from received ideas, to see the bigger, bigger picture. So that's, um, that's certainly been part of the argument. There's also, there's a lot of new books on this, and we mentioned this on the Humanities at Work site, but I think it's worthwhile if you're at all interested to note some of these. Um, George Anders' book, You Can Do Anything, uh, which argues that vocational majors, which usually train for one particular type of job, which can fluctuate with market demands, whereas where he traces all kind, you know, hundreds of liberal arts majors who have gone into a variety of careers, and one of the things he reports back from tracing all of these majors who have gone into a variety of careers is that they are particularly good at charting their own course, which is crucial in today's professional world, their ability to adapt and to innovate on the job market, to self-invent, to tell their story rather than just putting out a CV. And so all of the evidence that he collects is really showing not only just a diversity of what they can do, but also this ability to adapt and to be able to shift multiple, to multiple roles as a career arc evolves, and that that's how a career arc often does evolve. Um, we also had Christian Madsberg here a couple of years ago who wrote the book Sense Making, The Power of the Humanities and the Age of the Algorithm. And he is a, uh, he runs an international consulting firm that helps businesses think their way out of problems. And it's uh, based in Denmark and New York City. And he hires only liberal arts graduates. He's always hired only liberal arts graduates. And uh, in fact, he has them read Heidegger and he has them think their way through problems by way of philosophy, and he, it's a highly successful company. But his point, and why does he do so, as he, he told us a couple of years ago, is because the people who are coming from philosophy, literature, history, backgrounds, and the arts are able to really think their way through things very creatively and innovatively. They're not tied to prescriptive solutions and algorithms, and he, you know, it's one of the most successful consulting firms that you'll find. It's a, it's a great book. Uh, there's also been a lot of things in the news lately about the liberal arts and the tech sector. Scott Hartley's book, The Fuzzy and the Techie, or Randall Strauss's book, A Practical Education, where he follows liberal arts graduates in Silicon Valley, and he shows the tremendous impact that they're making. And both of these writers point out that as everything becomes more automated and formula-driven, the people who are staying ahead of the invention curve, are, and, and the ones who are offering the most innovative ideas are often the humanists. Right? They're also, they also tend to be the communicators, Scott Hartley says, who manage this crucial interface between the technology and the, and the human user, right? between the machine and its coding, and who's actually using it and why. And so as the technology increases, the need for that human person to stand in the gap between those two is increasing. And the ability to stay ahead of the innovation curve, that's what Hartley talks a lot about. He says that's, that's really what's happening. And you know what? If you look at, there's been a lot in the news about this. Don't just take my word for it. Forbes said in 2015, they wrote a great article on why the liberal arts degree has become tech's hottest ticket. Business Insider did a story about Microsoft's big self-analysis study, right? So when Microsoft did this analysis of their whole company and who's actually succeeding and what types of skills are really leading to career success in that field, they continually found that it's the liberal arts majors who are really making a, an impact. And when they traced it, they found more, you know, they were actually surprised to find that. Um, 
Brad Smith, the president, was the one who called for and, and then defended that study. Even more so, Google did a similar thing. The Google did a self-study that showed when they looked at their company and they looked at who's actually rising the farthest, right? Not maybe where are they coming in, but where are they going and how are they rising? It was the people with the humanities majors or liberal arts heavy skills that were, that were rising the farthest in the company. You, you, could, you might enter higher at Google if you come in with tech, but who was emerging as the leaders, the visionaries, the ones who were really challenging the innovation curve? They found out that it was humanities and they didn't expect to find that when they did that study. So, you know, again, don't take my word for it. Google it. It's, uh, it was all over the web a couple of years ago. So I think that's really important. Here's right, the guys reading Nietzsche. So, you know, I guess if you can uh, discern the fact that history is not inherently teleological, then you're ready for just about any idea in a board meeting, right? You can think your way out of any, any box if you can handle that point, right? Matt, Matt will back me up on that. Here's another thing that I, another thing that I think will, will be interesting to you. Look at the GMAT, right? What's the GMAT? GMAT is the test that you take if you're going to enter graduate school in business, right? What does it test? It tests quantitative reasoning, verbal reasoning, integrated reasoning, and analytical writing. Now look at this from the 2010 profile of GMA admission test candidates, breakdown of how majors scored. Philosophy scored in the highest. History scored again, well, well, uh, well up there. Art history scored very high. English scored in the top half. Languages scored in just about in the top half on the G. Look at the business majors on this test. Accounting, business education, marketing, management, right? So <laughs> that's why there are people who are going into careers out of humanities and succeeding, right? That's why Yahoo Finance did a study in 2015 where they based this on pay scale data that was released in the Wall Street Journal where they said, if you look at median mid-career salaries, again, you think about entry-level salaries, that's one thing, but what about the career arc? How are people being able to innovate beyond that entry-level position? And then if you look at median mid-career salaries, English and philosophy majors were making more than people with degrees in business administration. Again, look up, that's just look up the study. It's the pay scale study, and it was in Yahoo Finance in 2015. Let's look at the LSAT scores. You notice a similar, a similar thing to the GMATs, right? You would think that there are certain social sciences that might lead directly to law school, and they certainly do. We have excellent programs in them here, but it's just a little bit of a skewed view to say that if you want to go, again, that we think there's a specific major that leads to it. Look at the LSAT scores. Philosophy leads the list, again. History, English, arts and humanities are all in the top half of the LSAT scores, whereas you know, political science, criminal justice, tracks that you might think go direct, directly into it or, or lower, and that's according to 2014 law school admissions, right? Um, there was a whole thing going on politically a couple of years ago where politicians really just started to run with this idea that you shouldn't go into the humanities and you shouldn't study, you know, uh, history and, and literature, and, you know, it was a politically hot idea to do it, right, because universities were also saying, we need to sell you on, on particular careers and you know, job-related majors. So Jeb Bush said famously, right, it's important to have a liberal arts degree, but realize you're going to be working at a Chick-fil-A, right? So everybody got really high. So but what about the liberal arts, you know, what about liberal arts majors among politicians? Jeb Bush <laughs> majored in Latin American studies at UT Austin, which is a very liberal arts heavy program. Liberal, I mean, UT Austin's one of the most liberal arts uh, heavy PhD programs. George W. Bush majored in history, Mitt Romney in English, Mario Cuomo in English, Mike Huckabee, of course, in religion. So, I mean, you know, and again, and this is on both sides of the aisle. I mean, I happen to list a few uh, Republican politicians here, but remember, it was people on both sides of the aisle that were doing this. Obama said, uh, don't major in art history. So everybody was picking up that football, but remember that a large number of them did study the liberal arts themselves. So don't let them make you choose based on, right? It's because they're hard. So anyway, um, that's all I really have to say. If you look at our humanities at work side, I think you'll see a lot of those things there. And you can look more deeply into some of the claims I've made here. It's all, you know, a lot of that's up there or you can Google for yourselves. Um, but with that said, I just want to uh, you can, uh, yeah, I just want to turn things now over to our panel and maybe start things off with Jason Mancini, who's Director of Connecticut Humanities and History Major back in the day. Um, back in the day, that's right. And then we'll, <laughs> <laughs> but I was English way back in the day, so, and then we'll open things up for question after they're done with them. Well, that was a wonderful introduction to humanities. Um, 
I don't have prepared remarks, but what I will do is, um, and I think the rest of the panel here will sort of reflect on our experiences. I'll certainly reflect on mine, um, and happy to answer questions at the end. Um, so I did, uh, I was here uh, in the very early 90s. I graduated in 94 with a history degree. I uh, had also become quite interested in the nascent uh, environmental studies program. Uh, I went on to complete a master's degree and a PhD in anthropology at the University of Connecticut. Um, a lot of my interest in humanities was really grounded in my early life experience. Um, from the time I can really remember, uh, I, I uh, developed an interest in, in archaeology. Um, and that passion um, in archaeology, especially indigenous archaeology, uh, was fostered by uh, an uncle of mine uh, who's a tribal archaeologist in the town I lived in. Um, I grew up in eastern Connecticut. Uh, my uncle uh, worked for the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, if any of you have ever been to Foxwoods Resort Casino. Um, you'll be familiar with this uh, tribal community. So um, my, my, um, my earliest memories are, are working on archaeological sites um, from the time I was seven or eight years old um, and really sort of developing this passion in Native American history. Um, and I continued this through high school. Um, and by the time uh, I was ready for college, my uncle strongly advised me not to study archaeology. Um, so that opened my pathway at Fairfield um, to try some new things and really to diversify my, my interests and experience. And, and I will reflect, um, you know, some of the things that were most uh, memorable uh, from my time here uh, were the courses that made me think critically, um, really pushed me beyond my, uh, my, the, the assumptions I had about the world. Uh, specifically remember a, a colonial Latin American history that challenged how histories are being written. Why are they being written? Uh, who is the audience? Um, and beginning to dismantle uh, older colonialist ideas of how histories are, are narrated and who else has a right to narrate those histories. Um, and that was very relevant to my own experience working with an Indian tribe and, and indigenous people in the New England region. Um, for any of you who have grown up here or pretty much anywhere in North America, um, Indian people have, have been uh, erased from our, our shared narratives. Um, and that's partly because um, uh, they've, never, they've never authored, in, in historically never authored uh, significant resources. Um, so my interest became um, really enmeshed and immersed in opening up new pathways to, to those narratives. Um, I had also developed uh, an interest in environmental studies and biology um, and uh, eventually ethnobotany. Um, I was really interested in sciences. Um, no, no offense to the, anybody with an interest in science, but I thought they were kind of boring without human experience and interaction. Um, so my interest became more and more cross-disciplinary, uh, and I pursued those interests. Um, while I was in, interested in ecology, I wanted to know how people influence the environment, change the world around them, and how that, in turn, affected them. Uh, so you know, these, these are the, the experiences I had here at Fairfield, and I was able to sort of take those, those critical thinking skills um, uh, and, and bring them to graduate school, bring them back to the reservation that I worked on, and build a career around that. Um, one of the things, I don't want to go too far off the rails right now, but um, one of the things that I realized, um, for those of you who spend a lot of time at the Sea Grape and um, keg parties on campus or off campus. I don't know what the rules are that govern that. Uh, I think by the time I, I became a junior, um, I realized I kind of had enough of that. Um, and I really started uh, migrating away from um, the regular parties uh, and beginning to develop my own ideas and, and interests and really pushing them, um, finding my interests, developing them, um, and that took me sometimes away from campus. I remember doing an internship at, at Yale's Peabody Museum um, where I had a chance to get into the collections and do some curatorial work um, through an internship program at the time. 
Um, and those were important moments for me um, that opened my eyes to other cultures, um, getting me out of my comfort zone with Native American history and culture and into other world cultures. Um, so um, I also want to mention, too, um, I made a note here um, really about checking, checking my privilege. Um, this is a pretty wealthy place. Um, and, and coming from an Indian reservation, and actually there's two res Indian reservations in eastern Connecticut that I, I worked on. Um, these are some of the, before the casinos, they were some of the poorest places uh, in North America, um, and, and in many cases still are. Um, so becoming really aware of the people I was working with and their experiences and developing empathy around that uh, while I worked with them um, really enabled me to build a deeper relationship uh, among the communities that I would eventually uh, build a career with. Um, so I, I can certainly talk more about that, but I'd like to just mention as, as I graduated, new opportunities opened up um, as, as the Pequot community became remarkably successful with Foxwoods Casino, uh, they turned their attention to building other endeavors, um, and one of them was the Mashantucket Pequot Museum. Um, so just as I graduated, that doorway opened, um, and I began to do not just the archaeological work, but uh, the museum needed researchers, they needed collections uh, managers, they needed curators, and I really kind of was open to trying all of this new uh, work uh, in the museum world. I had no professional experience in the museum world, but um, other people were coming in from that world, and I was asking questions. I was exploring um, new ideas, new, um, new career paths through that. Um, so I held different positions at the Pequot Museum as it was being developed, um, uh, you know, both in terms of research, in terms of collections management, curation, um, one of my positions came back to archaeology, but then I developed more administrative roles by getting involved in um, uh, a deeper level of archival research and exhibit development. Uh, and through that, um, I continued, I began to, to expand my, my graduate career. And once I completed my master's degree, I was able to start thinking about teaching. Um, and I really enjoyed the, the uh, identifying stories that nobody had really thought about or heard or told and bringing that to bear for a public that was largely uninformed. Um, and because I was able to, to, to develop these new stories um, and frame them within both history and anthropology, um, I, I um, had decided I wanted to, to teach. Um, and, and so I, I had a, there was an opportunity at the University of Connecticut uh, beginning to um, do some adjunct um, teaching. And I did that, um, learned some new fields just by trying it, um, but then really developed my expertise um, as a cross-disciplinary field of ethno-history, which is sort of at the intersection of history and anthropology. Um, and my, my work um, began to translate into new areas of, of research. Most people think about Indian people American Indians on the land, living on reservations. Um, what my research revealed, because I was asking these critical hard questions about a population of people, um, when they're not on the reservations, where are they? Um, and by asking that and, and looking at archival records and really probing that deeply and, and with a, a regional framework, I realized that many indigenous people were actually getting on maritime vessels um, and traveling the waters of the world. Um, most people don't think of Indian people beyond the land, um, but I was finding them all over the world because of their transit on whale ships and commercial vessels. Um, and through that, I was able to develop um, not just an understanding of that, but a deeper understanding of the social networks they were forming. I think we're all familiar with Facebook and Instagram. These are ways, really interesting ways and modern ways of communicating amongst one another, but translating that social network narrative to how people interact on a human level with one another across social boundaries, social worlds, economic environments, and so on, really um, began to inform my work in a new way. And I was able to sort of develop a reputation around that through my academic work, 
um, and, and build on that. And every time I wrote a paper, you know, here, here's a little trick of the trade if you're going on to graduate school. Um, every time you have to write a paper, think of it as a chapter in your master's thesis or your doctoral dissertation. Um, makes your pathway a lot easier. Um, so, so I did that, and, and along the way, both, both through um, these teaching experiences and being open to new opportunities, but the, the work and the relationships I was building at the museum expanded um, to a global um, framework. Um, the, the indigenous communities I was working with in southern New England, all of a sudden, I learned they had relatives in New Zealand. They had relatives in Hawaii. They had relatives in Alaska. So I began tracking these relationships down and traveling around the world in pursuit of these new histories that nobody's ever heard, um, and developing new exhibits and publishing works on it, um, So and participating in humanities conferences at Mystic Seaport, um, where Nels and I met. Um, so these are the kinds of things that were, were really inspiring to me. Um, but I was still hungry. I was developing an interest in administrative work. I wanted, uh, I had an opportunity to move from um, leading the research department at the museum um, to directing uh, the Pequot Museum, which I did for three years, four years, um, which was an entirely different challenge, but was really rooted in the same kinds of things, relationship building, connecting people to stories, uh, making it relevant. Um, to their lives, um, understanding diverse communities um, with an inclusive framework. Um, so that, that interest in, in engaging um, a broader community beyond tribal communities uh, became really important. And then um, my, my interest continued. Um, an opportunity emerged at Connecticut Humanities um, where uh, Connecticut Humanities is, is partly uh, a granting organization that funds other organizations to tell great stories uh, or uh, panel discussions to tell great stories, both the creation, uh, implementation, dissemination of those stories. Um, what also really intrigued me and inspired me, um, and I would encourage all of you to look at it, are our digital humanities, which is an entirely, um, I wouldn't say new now, but it's continuing to emerge. Uh, the digital humanities realm is really interesting. Um, from when I first encountered um, this by mapping these voyages of indigenous mariners around the world and tracking their global travels, um, to the work we do with ConnecticutHistory.org, um, which is sort of an encyclopedia of Connecticut history. Um, working with the state historian today for a website called, a website and NPR, um, pieces every day. Um, um, today in Connecticut history is, is a daily dose of, of something relevant to us in this state. Um, we're working on um, a collaboration with the Office of Tourism for the state um, on an app called Contours with C-O-N-N -N Tours and that's bringing to bear um, the, the, the relevant histories of Connecticut and placemaking uh, for Connecticut, but, but bringing these stories to life again um, that have been long buried um, and hidden from, from our understanding and view. Um, there's, lot, there's lots out there um, and we're hoping to, to lead the way, um, not just in Connecticut, but nationally. So that's probably consumed my eight minutes, um, <laughs> but uh, it's probably a good framework and I can turn it over. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so just by way of reintroduction, my name is Courtney Darts. I graduated in 2001 with a double major in English and Art History. Um, and today I am a lawyer working at a nonprofit um, that serves other nonprofits in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Um, and the path of how I got from there to here um, in five minutes. Um, so. Uh, I, before I even start that, I just want to say how inspiring it is to see so many people in the room here um, and coming on, giving up your evening to, to hear us talk about our careers and you're all starting out and figuring out what you want to do and it's, it's just such a great time and I'm, I'm super excited for all of you and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about my experience. Um, 
So I came to English and art history um, as a major, as majors, um, just because that's what I liked the most. Um, and one of the things I really loved about my Fairfield experience um, was that the curriculum encouraged you to try a lot of different areas. Um, and so I took classes in philosophy and history, and I took um, language classes, and I took math and science, and but English and art history is what stuck. Um, and partly that had to do with the subject matter, and partly it had to do with the wonderful faculty in those programs, um, some of whom are here this evening. Um, and I, this may have been naive of me, but I always just trusted that I would find a job when I graduated. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I think this is the exciting thing about being a humanities student, and also the scary thing about being a humanities student is the possibilities seem infinite. And so, um, as we were preparing for this talk, uh, Professor Bowen reminded me that I went through a period of discernment when I graduated, which is a polite way of saying that I was trying a lot of different things and trying to figure out what would, would suit me in my career. Um, and I did that as an undergraduate, too. I had internships. I always worked throughout college um, for financial need, but also because I enjoyed it. It was a good resume builder. Um, but I really didn't know when I graduated exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and I was thinking about graduate school. Um, I thought maybe I would like to teach. So that um, led me, a year after I graduated, to actually come back to Fairfield and work in the Visual and Performing Arts Department um, as the department coordinator. And I did that because I wanted to see what it was like on the inside uh, to be a university professor and to get a real sense of what it would be like to go to graduate school and the job market and try to make as informed a decision as possible um, before I made a decision about committing several years of my life to further education. Um, and that was a great experience for many reasons, um, not the least of which is that the faculty continued to mentor me even as their employee, no longer their student, um, and gave me opportunities to do grant writing. And so in that, I sort of found um, an opportunity to use the research and the writing skills that I had developed through my humanities courses, um, but in a very practical application um, and sort of sparked or fueled um, my own sense of social justice. And so that led to the decision to go to law school. And I would not have thought when I graduated in 2001 that I would be going to law school in 2005, but that's what I did. Um, I went to Fordham, so another good Jesuit school. Um, and I went with the intention of doing public interest law. Um, and so there's a pretty clear connection. I mean, it's, it's been mentioned a couple of times um, this evening already that for those of us who go to law school, um, there, the humanities are well represented in the ranks of law school um, attendees, uh, although there are plenty of people who did economics and business degrees. Um, some of my closest friends have been anthropology majors, philosophy majors, history majors, language majors. Um, and here we all were in the same place, taking the same classes, preparing to be uh, lawyers. Um, I worked for a firm for a year when I graduated, which was also a good experience, but my heart lay with doing public interest work, and so I moved in 2009 to the nonprofit where I still work today uh, called Pro Bono Partnership. We recruit and support volunteer lawyers from large law firms and in-house legal departments to provide pro bono legal services to nonprofits serving underserved communities or providing other important services, um, as I said, in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And I was a staff attorney there for six years, and then I became the first director of education there, and now I'm the first legal director there, um, and so have moved out of the day-to-day -day of working with clients and am now in more of a managerial role. And so, um, you know, briefly, I, like I said at the beginning, I chose my majors just because that's what I loved studying. I mean, it's such a gift to spend four years of your life um, studying something that's interesting and motivates you every day. Um, if you can make a career out of doing the same thing, that's an even greater gift. Um, and so the things that I loved about my undergraduate courses, the research, the writing, the critical thinking skills that were developed, um, all translate beautifully to the work I do day to day. I mean, everything obviously as a lawyer but also as a manager is about research and writing and making your case. I do a fair amount of fundraising now. Clearly that's also about communications. Um, you know, I think that studying English and art history, you, you, it's the study of people, right? You're, you're, at least it was for me, you're reading novels, you're thinking about the arc of human history as expressed through the visual arts. Um, it really honed, I think, my 
uh, approach to the world, a sense of empathy, um, an ability maybe to put myself in other people's shoes that came from reading all those novels. Um, and and I, I really think it makes me a better manager. And as, as uh, Dr. Pearson mentioned, I do think that it has made me a good critical thinker and a very adaptive personality as well. I'm always looking to continue to learn. And I do see that in my friends who were humanities majors. Um, not to say that that's not true of other people as well, but um, we sort of go into life always curious, and you're always trying to learn more about yourself and about the world, and um, and that's a wonderful thing to carry through your whole career. Um, and so, even though a fair amount of my day now involves things like databases and uh, coding the website, and you know these skills that are less directly connected to what I studied, I'm interested in them now for the same reason I was interested in English and art history. That's what I think is interesting, and I always want to continue learning. Um, and I think that. Uh, you, um, you're always going to be learning in your career. You know, jobs exist today that no one could have imagined when I graduated in 2001. And so I do think that, um, you know, coming to college, I can, I can certainly understand it, right? College is a huge um, commitment of money and time, and I can certainly understand why students um, may feel pressure or concern that they have to sort of major in the right thing to make themselves marketable in, in the job search. I, I do get that. But um, I think that, um, you know, the whole point of this panel and why we're here tonight is to say that, that you, you can come out on the other side with a job, that there's no one path to professional success, um, and that, you, you know, if you can be true to yourself and what interests you and, and maintain your curiosity, those are the things that will really serve you very well in whatever job you do. So I'll step aside and turn it over to Matt. <laughs> um. Very glad to be with you all today. It's a little bit warmer down here than it is in Boston, just a little bit, but this is the time of year where any degree warmer is good. Um, it's a really interesting experience to kind of reflect on life and try to identify the threads that tie all the years together and um, where our choice of major uh, fits into the whole thing. And then in eight minutes or less, tell you something that is hopefully helpful on your own journey. Um, I must remind you I was a philosophy major and so brevity is not my natural tendency, uh, something Father Duty can, can attest to, um, but I will do my best. Um, first let me tell you a little bit about my life since Fairfield uh, to give some context for how studying philosophy has impacted my course. Uh, after graduating here I moved to Washington DC uh, where I spent three years working in and then managing a large home for adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, I then moved to Boston to attend graduate school at Boston College, also a, another fine Jesuit university, uh, where I earned my Master's of Social Work degree with a particular focus on program design and systems development. Uh, in my professional life now, I manage the Evidence-Based Policy Institute at Judge Baker Children's Center, uh, which is a Boston-based Harvard affiliate that specializes in child and family mental health. Um, at the Institute, we work with state and national partners to address pervasive issues through legislative advancements and systems reform, uh, utilizing all scientifically proven practices and approaches. Uh, much of my work is with the Massachusetts State Legislature, uh, state and community agencies, advocacy organizations, and service providers to ensure that the services and supports we're making available to youth and families um, are maximally effective. Um, we also have a fellowship program where we train uh, graduate and undergraduate interns who are interested in public policy and children's mental health. There are summer internship opportunities, so if any of you live near Boston and are interested, feel free to talk to me after. Um, and then as of September, I will also be uh, on the adjunct faculty at Boston College School of Social Work. Um, in my personal life, I am an avid musician, a lover of the outdoors, and a coffee enthusiast, something I think I discovered during finals while at Fairfield. <laughs> um, but above all things, I consider myself someone who's very committed to the pursuit of truth with the capital T um, in my own life and in the world around me. Um, I've always been fascinated with relationships, both interpersonal relationships and the importance of those on our individual well-being, uh, but also cultural and societal relationships and how changes in one corner of society can have sometimes profound impacts in another corner. 
and then to understand where things overlap and where gaps exist. Um, I began to realize that everything in life comes down to these links, these sometimes opaque connections in our everyday lives. Um, and when I discovered philosophy in Professor Seeley's class, um, I discovered a reflection of the person that I was, uh, the person I had always been and the person I still am today. Um, I chose philosophy, simply put, because it felt like the right thing to do and it made me happy. Um, and every decision I've, I've made since then has been in pursuit of discovering and then actualizing the person I'm truly meant to be. Um, in all of its complexities and its imperfections and strengths and vulnerabilities, um, to look beyond what others might say I'm supposed to do and instead discover what it is I'm meant to do. Um, and it was, it was clear to me that philosophy as a major was the necessary choice that led in that direction. Um, I had no idea what that meant, and in some ways I'm still figuring it out, but I knew that's what I needed to do. Um, the first and maybe only message I'd like to convey to you is this, that the decisions you make should always be in alignment with the person that you are and in the pursuit of the person that you're meant to be. Um, it seems to me that the world has more than its fair share of folks who are doing exactly what they've been told they're supposed to do. And all too often, the person they're told they should be is very different from the person they really are. Um, and there's something in this world that when you discover it, it'll fit like a glove. And as students at a university, uh, you have unparalleled access to all the exploration and all the discovery that your minds and hearts could want. Um, my decision to study philosophy was the most surprising and best discovery I could have made. Uh, because in addition to learning how to endure relentless mocking from my friends, um, I, I also learned the value of pursuing what's important to me. Um, it taught me how to think critically, analyze problems from every angle, and to identify and pursue solutions. It taught me how to comprehend complexity and break it down to its simplest parts. It taught me how to look beyond the obvious, the value in understanding another person's perspective, especially in a heated debate. Um, and to see the connection between all things. Uh, it taught me that the best questions in life are the ones with the least obvious answers because those are the ones that teach you to think for yourself. Um, and it taught me to be comfortable with the unknown and with the unanswerable because life, especially life after college, requires comfort with the unknown and with the unanswerable. Um, and it taught me that I have a place in this world, that the person I am, the way I think about things, and the way I approach problems has a place and can have a meaningful impact on the world around me. Um, you each have a place in this world. You are meant to find it. You are designed to experience joy and to find your way through significant hardship, uh, emerging from the other side better prepared and with greater capacity. Uh, you are meant for community and you are meant for friendship and you are meant for love. But most of all, you're meant to belong. Um, no path is free of challenge and trade-offs, and you will face your share of both no matter what direction you choose, uh, but there is a place where you belong. Um, and it's okay not to know what that means right now. Uh, just stay open to discovery and let it evolve as you do, and as your life circumstances change, as your understanding of yourself grows. Uh, but whatever you decide to do, make sure you really do it. No half-assed attempts. Um, anything worth doing is worth excelling in. Um, and when I told my parents I wanted to study philosophy, they said, great, that's exactly what you should do. Um, but if you're going to do it, do it well. Let no one ever accuse my parents of not knowing their son. Um, so I worked really hard. And when I graduated, I was awarded the Leventino Award for Excellence in Study of Philosophy. I was also an active member in the campus ministry community as a founding member and director of the Lord's Chords. Um, I sang in the Glee Club, I sang in the Chamber Singers and was an alumni mentor in the Ignatian Residential College, which at the time was in Loyola Hall, um, and I was actually Father Duty's alumni mentor. Um, and outside of school, I had a very active and healthy life. Um, my life was and still is driven by the things that I'm passionate about, and I sought to excel in them. So I ask you, where does your passion lead you, and how can you pursue it in a way that will lead to growth, to contribution to the greater social good, and to a sense of fulfillment and belonging. Um, to, reflect some, to, to reflect some of the wisdom imparted upon me by my Jesuit education, um, when you're faced with deciding the direction of your own life, what would the best version of yourself do? What brings you joy? What are you good at? And what does the world need? 
Um, and let me tell you, the world needs a lot. The world needs economists and innovators and musicians and graphic designers. The world needs social workers and lawyers and teachers. Um, the world needs role models. Um, the world needs people to seek out their own sense of belonging and to be the person that they were meant to be, uh, not the person they think someone else thinks they should be. Um, there's a great quote often attributed to Oscar Wilde, uh, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. And I think there's, I think there's wisdom in that. Um, so I urge you to find your place of belonging and, and pursue a life that's in line with who you are. Um, become the person you were meant to be and do something that needs doing. So I think I probably was close to eight, <laughs> somewhere in there. So thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Marino. Um, I'm gonna go through my experience from Fairfield to where I'm at now, and hopefully um, you guys can pick up some of the lessons I've learned along the way. Um, so when I arrived at Fairfield as a freshman, I was an English major with a news writing journalism concentration. I had the idea that I was going to be a magazine editor. I wanted to be a features writer, and magazines like what I want to do. So the first thing I think as humanities people um, is about being flexible. This job you think you might be doing might not really exist so much. The industry might change in like 10, 15 years time, right? So um, while at Fairfield taking classes in the core and thanks to much appreciated encouragement and support from specific faculty members here in this room, I declared minors in Spanish, minors in religious studies, and I changed my concentration from news writing to creative writing. Um, and so I also was involved in WVOF, the radio station. I had a radio show all four years while I was here. Um, really interested in music and in multimedia technologies. So it's something that is very cool, and I think it's been touched on in the panel, um, that as humanities majors, you're able to kind of dip your toes into different interests in ways that friends at, who are nursing majors or at the engineering school don't have that flexibility or have a more narrow track. Um, and so coming off of that, um, and something I really recommend for you guys as humanities majors is being able to study abroad. Um, you have such flexibility. I mean, even business majors have some restrictions about where they can go for study abroad. But as humanities majors, like the world is open to you, and Fairfield really encourages this. Um, so my junior year, I did a semester abroad at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. I was the only student from Fairfield that semester who went there. I'd never been on an airplane before I went there, much less out of the country. So I kind of got there, and it was like, wow, everyone I've ever known ever in my life um, is a five, six hour plane ride away. It was a bit of a moment. Um, so I learned a lot in that semester in living in a new place in a new country, and it it taught me that, you know, we're kind of ingrained that, at least, you know, being in school, that in order to be learning something, I've got to be sitting at a desk and there has to be a professor there talking to me, knowledge. Um, but that experience of studying abroad actually opened my eyes to being able to learn things outside the classroom. And it's really important because it's something that for most of your life, you actually will be outside a classroom and being able to learn through experience. Um, and so kind of, in addition to that, talking about out of the classroom experiences, my senior year at Fairfield, I had an internship, and again, still English major, so internship with WWE. Um, and yes, when people look at me, they're like wrestling, really. So yes, um, I, I interned with WWE, and um, I was not hired because I was like well-versed in Rey Mysterio and Sheamus. I was, I love how everyone's like, I, I could write well, I could communicate well, and those were the skills that I was hired for. Um, and it's something that I think we're very good at as humanities majors is being able to learn foreign content pretty quickly. So, you know, I, for example, in my religious studies minor, I took a course on um, the Dead Sea Scrolls with Dr. Harkins. I started that class being like, what is Talmud? And then by the end, I could know some things about Second Temple Judaism. So like, like that, my internship, I arrived literally my first week Googling like what is a pile driver. And by the end, <laughs> I'm not kidding, but by the end, I was writing the tweets, only they were called like updates for the mobile app. But you know, writing tweets about wrestling. 
So I think that's something that is so key, is being able to learn specific content very quickly. And I think it's something that people in humanities are very good at doing. Um, so then after I graduated Fairfield, um, upon recommendation by Dr. Johnson in the Modern Languages Department, I applied to work for the um, Ministry of Education in Spain to teach English. So I was living in Madrid for the year after I graduated teaching English um, with students at two different public schools. And then after I finished that contract, I moved back to the US, um, to New York, and I was applying for jobs. And someone I knew from my internship at WWE, he was working at a different company, but he got in touch with me and he's like, oh, I know you're, they're looking for work. Um, I, the company I work at, we don't have any openings right now, but we're moving offices. We've got a new, brand new fancy office and you know computers, so can you come and set up, the, like help set up the computers in this new office? So I'm like, okay, you know, I need, I need work. Um, so it was like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I was working you know, with the IT team to set up all their computers in the new office. Um, on Monday, the company called me up and they said, hey, you worked really well with us um, over the past weekend setting up the computers. Would you come and work um, in our quality assurance department? We have this opening and before we're gonna post it out there, you, know, you did really well. Um, so it's something that I know everyone in the career panel things you talk about your LinkedIn and your personal brand, but also like working hard, like in terms of just trying to do as much as you can in your job, people will remember that and they'll reach out and they'll want to help you. Um, and so the, the position I had was a temporary position. And while I was there, I was applying for other, other jobs um, and ended up getting a job with the Institute of International Education, um, IIE, and it was really helpful because my supervisor at the pharmaceutical company wrote me a really great recommendation and helped me get to that next position at IIE, Institute of International Education. And I worked there for a few years um, working on ed international educational exchange programs. So my role was supporting foreign Fulbright scholars who came to the US to do research and then I also worked on a program with the Brazilian government, which was Brazil Scientific Mobility Program, um, which was an exchange program for Brazilian students to come to the US. Um, and so that was a really great experience. And, um, but after about two and a half years, the program funding changed. And so we knew that within six months, our jobs weren't going to exist. Um, and again, flexibility in <laughs> being humanities. So I thought that this would be a good opportunity to um, go back to school, get a master's degree. Most of the people I was working with had master's degrees, and I thought it might catch up to me if I didn't have one after a while. So I um, got a master's in international relations from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland again. Um, and then after I finished that degree, moved back to New York um, and was hired by Columbia University to be the program coordinator for the Committee on Global Thought, which is where I work now. Um, and my job is doing um, events logistics, communications for the committee, supporting, we have a, a master's in global thought program, and um, I support the, the faculty in their research projects. Um, so yeah, and so my final kind of point, um, and something I actually asked my boss about, because I said oh, I was gonna come and speak with you guys tonight, and kind of what wisdom. Um, and he said that sometimes you need to turn right in order to go straight. And I think you know, the meaning is that things you might not expect can get to you somewhere. So if you were to ask me, you know, even when I was at Fairfield, how can I get to work for like IIE or Columbia? You know, I mean, and really I have had great experiences like being able to work for a bit Brazil and, and with those universities. I would never think, oh, well, that weekend you spent moving computers is going to come in handy. You know, like that internship that you had when you were at Fairfield or even that class that you took, you know, it's, it's something that you can't foresee, but that it, it does work out, and um, yeah, good luck, it'll be great.
Virginia, and uh, you mentioned it, but you didn't say anything about it. Yes. So you may want to expand on it a little bit, because I think it's a fascinating thing that you did. Sure, yeah. So Larsh, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's an international nonprofit that, as I alluded to, uh, focuses on creating homes uh, with adults with intellectual disabilities. And the, the word with is particularly important there uh, because whereas typical group homes, the individuals with disabilities and the individuals without disabilities, the support staff live separately. In the large community, um, there's this real emphasis on genuine home and genuine com community building. And so um, everyone lives together in the same home. It is, it's uh, originally a Catholic organization. Um, then, and then has, has expanded since, since now interdenominational across the world. Um, and yeah, like I said, the, the, the focus is on, uh, you know, building genuine community, genuine relationships, and the important impact that that has, uh, not just on service care and provision uh, in the day-to-day -day, um, caregiving setting, but also kind of in the bigger spiritual, emotional, you know, human sense of the word. So. Um, in addition to doing you know, daily things and helping support individuals with the daily life tasks, everything from getting out of bed in the morning, getting them off to their day programs, also managing their finances, managing med medical, um, medical appointments and the, the various things related to that. Um, there's also shared community you know, dinners. You have dinners together every night. There's you know, shared prayer after dinner. Um, and there's real emphasis on going through life together. So. Also realizing it's been a long time since I've had to describe to someone what Larsh is. Um. Um, I'll, I'll start, um, since I'm the art history representative on the panel. I mean, it's a jewel of the program, of, uh, it's a jewel of a program here at the university. Um, and I found that when I went into interviews, um, it was not, I mean, it depends on the job you're going for, but um, you could talk very intelligently, I think, about your um, research projects, the writing you had done, um, if you did the study abroad program, which many of the art history students here do. Um, I think, I think every interview, regardless of where you're coming from, is about selling yourself to an employer in some way, and so thinking critically before you walk in about what are the needs of the job, and then how can you take what's in your background and shape it to what they're looking for. So it's, it's interviewing skills, but it's also the cover letter. Um, uh, I spend a lot of time hiring people now. Cover letters are actually, I think they're still very important. I realize that um, in large companies, you know, people are uploading hundreds and hundreds of resumes and, and schools of thought on this differ, but for me, um, always in the interviewing and the hiring process, it's what is the case that this person can make for me about how what they've done in the past connects to what I'm looking for in this job. And so you do have to put some time into it. It is a time intensive way of looking for a job, which is not easy, I know. Um, but the people who can make that case is, it almost doesn't matter where they're starting from. The point is how do they align it to where I want them to go? Um, and then side note, um, which I did not, do very naturally when I was a student, but have since learned is essential. It's just like working your network. Um, and I know that's, you know, your network is small when you're a student, um, but it does grow. And probably Carolyn and Matt, being um, younger, can talk more intelligently about how you market yourself in the digital realm, because I've worked at the same place for 10 years. But um, I think that um, jobs come up through all different ways. And so um, casting your nets far and wide, letting people know sort of the kinds of things you're interested in, finding out what the professional associations are for those kinds of jobs, um, making connections. People cold call me all the time and say, how do I get the job you have? And I'm always happy to pay it forward and talk about, well, this is what I did. And, and you can do that too. People will be surprisingly generous with their time. So um, I think, you know, just, just work every avenue that you have to you. And, and then when you get in the door, focus on how, how what you have done in the past connects directly with what this person is looking for. Um, I would also add to that and say, 
you know, th things take a long time. And, you know, forever is a really long time. And so wherever you start, um, you know, you will have mobility, you will have opportunity to grow and to develop and to expand upon that. Um, I think it also is really important to start from a sense of you need to know what you do well. You also need to know where, where your limitations are um, and maybe have some vague idea about how you'd like to, to, to build on that and to, to develop. Um, but, you know, I mean, everything we've said today comes from, you know, between 10 and 25 years of, of doing it every day after college. And so, um, you know, I guarantee you that when we were in the chairs that you were in, we didn't have language for it and we didn't know what to say or even what we were trying to say. So, um, you know, also be gentle with yourself as you're trying to figure it out, hold yourself to a high standard, but give yourself the time um, and let yourself work into the, the job and into the career and into the life that, that you want. I, I can maybe just add briefly, um, I, I actually had my first interview a year and a half ago. Um, I never had to interview for a job before, but I will say that one, one of the things that translates really effectively, um, for me anyway, and what I've heard from each of uh, the panelists here, is, is your passion. Humanities people's, like, hu humanities folks like, like these folks, um, I'm sure many of you, find your passion, because that will translate far and wide. Um, and that's a thing that I, when, I, when I give lectures or give talks about the things that I love to do, it, 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 is, it has a huge impact. And if you, can, if you can find what that nugget is in your life and translate that to the world and make that connection, it's magic. Yeah, and I would just chime in with one thing and then we'll go over to Doc Orlando. But, um, I, well, I can't find it now, but if the, the book by George Anders and the book by Christian Madsbier on uh, the humanities and careers, it, I would read those. They have a lot of really good anecdotal stories about people who are trying to do exactly what you're trying to do. And so thinking about how other people navigated that can give you some ideas for how to do it. So the um, yeah, book by Anders and Madsbier. But. So I, I, didn't, I didn't have the experience of parents um, saying, don't do this. Um, what I did have is, you're, you, you love archaeology, expect to be poor for the rest of your life. And if you can deal with that. Um, you know, that that's one path. But what I, what I, for me, knowing that you know, our, there's not a lot of money in the field of archaeology, you can be a shovel bum for the rest of your life. But if you can take that passion and, and translate it upward and outward, you know, becoming the best at what you do um, and, and developing that passion, becoming, you know, for me it was becoming a curator at a museum. It was becoming a senior staff member in a research department. It was getting a master's degree in teaching. You know, if you can, if you can elevate yourself in those ways, you know, it, it goes from, you know, the, the level of finding an artifact and being excited about an artifact to being able to tell, you know, an incredible story and its relevance to humanity uh, and the human experience on an entirely different level. Um, being able to, to, to migrate from that one find to how do we narrate human history um, is, is an entirely different space. Um, and bringing it to a different audience like that, I think really ma it mattered for me. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, um, and this is the lawyer in me, but um, you do your research and you make your case. Um, and, <laughs> and you be your own advocate, um, because I think that is a very common attitude. In fact, um, I, I did not have that attitude with my parents, but I watched one of my roommates go through it. Her dad was a corporate executive, and um, he, said I was majoring in unemployment, and so was she. And um, now he was a history major, so I don't know what that was about. But, um, but I think, I think the, the, the reference, the resources you've been given tonight, you sort of 
think about where you want your career to go. And I think you 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 build your case that your parents um, can feel comfortable with your decision. And I, I absolutely recognize those are very, very hard conversations to have. Um, and funnily, I had them when I wanted to go to law school. <laughs> My parents were supportive of me being an English and art history major, but they thought law school sounded really hard and expensive. And so, um, uh, I mean, they were supportive, but they were kind of like, really? So, um, uh, you know, I think I think there's a lot of information out there, um, and and you can you can make a compelling, I think, um, argument as to where you see your career going, um, and and hopefully allay their fields, which are clearly coming from a loving place. But that that's a, a hurdle a lot of people have to get over, no doubt. Yeah, and I'll just one last thing about that is is um, you know life is has no shortage of, of hard situations that it's going to throw at you, and so. If this is one of the ones that you have to find your way through, it's just it's one of many. The good news is you are all perfectly capable of finding your way through whatever the hard situation life throws at you. Um, but but other than that, I would just I would echo, um, you know, think through. Uh, again, I I also was lucky that my folks, my father was also a corporate executive and was super okay with his son studying philosophy. Um, but but. You know, the, the, the one answer that I don't have is, is how do you effectively communicate the message because it's what I feel like I'm supposed to do to a parent. Um, and so in the end of the day, I think you just need to decide what course of action is the one that you need to go down and, and figure out how to get down it. Um, and it'll pass. That difficult time, like every difficult time, will pass. Oh, and I just wanted to add to that too, and I should have said this earlier, obviously alumni are a great resource for you. And um, they were resources for me when I was here, and I'm always happy to speak to Fairfield students. I think a lot of alumni you find are very generous with their time, and the art history program in particular was a standout in this area when I was here because of the database that Dr. Schwab mentioned. They do an alumni forum every three years where people come. A lot of people got jobs out of it. My sister was also an art history major at Fairfield. She did an internship at Christie's that came through an art history alumni who was working there, she moved into events planning. That was her career, and that was directly related to this internship that she got through an alum that she connected with through her major. So um, definitely work your alumni connections as well. Michelle, I don't know if you want to chime into that. I mean, we have an, a Fairfield art history grad and Michelle DeMarzo who's translated that into a PhD and then into museum administration as, and a faculty position. So, I mean. Yes, well, and I was friends with Courtney's sister Mary. Yes. Right. Both are bridesmaids. So. <laughs> And I think it's also, you know, it's important to think as lo as long term as you can, you know. And they tell you when you learn to drive, I forget, but they'd say look like two miles out or whatever it is. So like look into the near future. You, you know, very seldom are you totally at the whim of whatever winds are blowing. So you can strategically place yourself in a in a direction and in a position to lead to career growth and to lead to change, kind of no matter where you begin. Um, and I think that's an important perspective to take when you're trying to figure out where to go. Um, and the other thing, which is a little bit adjacent but important too, is, is never undervalue the, 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 the wonder that is networking. Um, I, I similarly have had very few job interviews in my life um, because most, most of, of what I've done has been discovered through networking. The job I have now, I was, in, I was a graduate student at BC and I went to a conference in Tampa, Florida 
and my now boss was presenting on some of the work that's getting done at Judge Baker. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and so I went up to him and talked to him after, um, and we exchanged contact information. We got back, we got together for coffee when we were back in Boston. Two or three conversations later, I figured out that I was actually being interviewed, and about a week <laughs> after that, uh, they offered me a job, and here I am. Um, so networking. I just, well, I'll chime in real quick as a question. I, when I was putting together the panel, I really liked the way that each one of you pursued graduate degrees, but at all kinds of different stages, and none of them were things that it seemed to me that you were going into right away. I mean, maybe Jason, yours was the most sort of direct line, but I know a lot of you who are seniors who are finishing your you know, undergraduate degrees are thinking about, should I go to graduate school? And I get this question all the time, like, should I take the GREs right now? And should I, shouldn't I go directly into graduate school? And just pause for a second and look at how all of these people, they didn't go right in. They started in careers. They had their, what was your, Carolyn, what was your position, your period called? Or no, period it was court, your period of discernment for Courtney. <laughs> but, you know, in fact, we're, at faculty members, we're often great. saying, yeah, right, yeah, we're often saying, no, you don't have to finish a PhD in six years after getting your undergrad. It often goes about it in different ways. Do, do any of you want to talk about that? Where, you know, how, how did you realize the graduate degree was the right one? Did, you know, what couldn't have been the right one when you originally graduated? I mean, I actually did apply um, to, um, graduate programs my senior year at uh, Fairfield because it is a bit of a thing I think where you know it feels very much where you've always been in school and now it's like what am I going to do and well how, how can more school be wrong right which you know but I think it's important that you see that you know there might not necessarily be a rush to do that right then and there and that it can be very valuable to get some different experiences to get a better sense of actually which graduate degree is right for you, right for like your long-term like professional goals, um, as opposed to kind of jumping into something maybe because you kind of don't know what else to do or because you're scared of, of you know, being in this kind of place of discernment. Um, I, I found it, it much more valuable also in my, when I did go to graduate school, having had the professional experience, um, it was such a, a weird experience because actually in my program, um, there are only a few of us who had worked for you know some time before doing the program. There were many people who were like right out of undergrad, and it was just a very different experience. I think for us, um, you know, it, it was very beneficial because we could see how the work that we're doing in the classroom could relate to a professional kind of a longer trajectory, um, and I. I Again, I mean, you always think about who's giving you the advice. So I find like usually people who tell you go right to grad school are people who did that, and then people, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I really encourage you to not rush into anything and to have some experiences, professional experiences, um, you know, when you have that opportunity. And I, I would say again, forever is a really long time. The rest of your life is a really long time. Um, so, so give yourself that time and space to discover where you're headed and what makes the most sense. I actually thought I was going to go to law school, um, and and um, I, maybe I still will. I don't know. Um, but when I was working in Larish, I was working with uh, a bunch of MSWs, and I had never really given much thought or knew much about social work. But then I was I was you know working with folks, and they were talking about you know macro social work, macro social work, and I was, what is that? Um, and it's what I just described to you while working at the policy and systems level to enact change. And um, I was particularly interested with the, the science-based approaches. So, um, you know, that found me. Um, and the other thing I would say is, is by giving yourself space and time, you also give yourself space to change course. You can kind of always change course, but like graduate school is really expensive, so think about it. Um, but, but, you know, changing course is a perfectly viable option. Um, and, and again, that's where if you position yourself, you can, you can always kind of think three steps ahead. You can always kind of see the direction you're headed in. And is it where you're going? Ask yourself, where do I want to be a year from now? Is this it? Is, is what, what, where does this lead to? Where will I be a year from now if I stay here? Um, thinking in 12-month intervals, you know, is a good way to start. I, I, I just wanted to comment on a personal level. I changed a lot in my early 20s. Um, you're still growing in many ways and finding out who you are as a person. And I think 
um, you've already gotten excellent advice on this point, but I'm just going to echo Matt's point that student loan debt is very, very real. And so um, I think that for me, it was a given that I would work um, regardless before making that commitment. Um, but it also gave me the space to make sure, feel more confident in the decision I was making, to apply for the financial aid that made it feasible for me to go into the area of law that I wanted to do. That was a whole year's process. Um, so taking your time, um, I don't think, I don't think that it hurts you to take some time in your early 20s in any way. Um, so some people will know this is what they want to do and they will go straight through. But I think if you're, if you're going to it to try to figure out what it is you want to do, that's probably not the right use of graduate school and you'd be better served to work for a little while before you commit. Not to mention working for a while makes you more appealing to graduate schools yes. um, in, a, in, a, in a significant way, especially in today's world where master's degrees um, are becoming more and more the norm. Kind of to your point from before, the more you can demonstrate experience and, 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 a, and a skill set and a desire to continue to build that skill set, the more appealing you will be to the universities that you apply to and also the more appealing you will be to the financial aid offices of those universities that are the ones handing out scholarships. So. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Other? How are we on? Yeah, I was, yeah, definitely. You mean for them to just talk independently? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I think that's a great idea. Uh, in fact, let's just take the rest of the time to just meet our panelists, come up and talk to them, you know, and they'd be happy to. Thank you.